everybody. Welcome. I'm Shelly Palmer, and this is Web3 Wednesday. At least it's still Web3 Wednesday for now. We need a new name, so we'll take your suggestions. What would a great new name for Web3 Wednesday be? Like, um... AI Wednesday? I don't know. Anyway, welcome, everyone. Uh, I am, again, Shelley Palmer. We are in the shadow of the Empire State Building right here in New York City. It is a beautiful day, and we are talking AI and things um, <clears throat> emerging tech. We're going to start today with, uh, oh, war games in real life, and then we're going to go on and talk a little bit about mind reading, AI being able to read your mind now. We'll talk about private chat GPT, and we're going to talk a little bit about our resource pages. Uh, we're also going to talk deeply about uh, AI voice cloning and some of the dangers there. I'm going to show you some demos of Gen 2 by Runway Research. That's just some insane text to video. Then we're going to talk, uh, talk a little bit about default to distrust, which may be the default we have to get to at this point. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Marvin and Bob and Carolyn and Frank. I'm glad you guys are all here. Talk to each other. Talk to me. You can uh, put any questions you might have in chat. And the um, beautiful and talented Joey Lewandowski will put them into the system, and I can put them up on screen for everyone. Hey, Stephen. Hey, David. Glad you guys are all here. Um, this is a... Really interesting time. About a thousand apps every 30 days are showing up. We're going to go through some of them today. Everything is generative AI all of the time. While we're here, before we get deep into this, um, at Shelly Palmer is where you want to tweet. I want you tweeting today. That's important. And of course, it is a Web3 Wednesday, so you can get your POAP, your Proof of Attendance Protocol Token, POAP. ShellyPalmer.com slash POAP. What is a POAP? Well, it proves you've been here. It's your proof of attendance protocol uh, NFT, but you don't need a digital wallet. You can just use your email address. Uh, this is today's. If you collect five of them, as you know, you can come to our uh, private events, our salons, our super secret back room handshake uh, dinners, uh, some of the things that we do online, which are uh, invitation only. So please go to ShellyPalmer.com slash POAP, collect all five and see how you do. Uh, before we get started also, um, courses.ShellyPalmer.com is where we have generative AI for executives. We just added two more sections, one about privacy and security, and the other about autonomous agents. Both of those things are really important. Uh, so it, we try to keep this as up-to-date as possible, and, and literally, we're just working on it every single day. So don't forget to tweet. Remember, at Shelly Palmer, take a screenshot, do whatever, and let's let's get started. So War Games. Remember the movie with Matthew Broderick? It was um, about uh, an AI named Whopper, W-O-P-R, the War Operations something something, and uh, Whopper was a... Uh, artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence, I guess, science fiction back then. And its job was to protect the United States. And it did war game simulations. And somehow uh, Matthew Broderick convinces this thing or somebody convinces this thing that uh, it's going to do a war game only. It's actually launching real missiles. And the whole movie is about getting it to stop doing that. And the climax of the movie is really funny because the, the at the climax of the movie, Matthew Broderick's character starts to play a game of tic-tac-toe with the AI and it goes through, I don't know, hundreds or thousands or millions of iterations of the game of tic-tac-toe, which as everyone knows is unwinnable. <clears throat> and then the AI comes up with the idea, interesting game, tic-tac-toe. The only way to win is not to play. Well, <laughs> in movies, in literature, as in life, I don't, I don't know how else to say this. Um, here we are. Proposed by, I'm just reading this, Senator Edward Markey, uh, for, uh, Democrat from Massachusetts, uh, Ted Liu, uh, Don uh, Bayer of Virginia, and Ken Buck, a Republican of Colorado. This is called the Block Nuclear Launch by Autonomous Artificial Intelligence Act. Yeah, they proposed it. It's been proposed. Legislation. And the goal here is to pro prohibit the use of federal funds for launching nuclear weapons via automated systems without meaningful human control. Yeah. Here's a quote from Senator Markey. We need to keep humans in the loop on making life or death decisions to use deadly force, especially for our most dangerous weapons, unquote. No human would ever make a mistake because they were too emotional, would they? Here's a quote from uh, 
Representative uh, Buck. Let's see. What did he say? Use of AI for deploying nuclear weapons without a human chain of command is uh, and control, without command and control, is reckless, dangerous, and should be prohibited. Yeah. Co-sponsors of this bill are Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. I am very interested in what you think about this. I... I am of so many different minds when it comes to what this is. Of course human beings need to be in the chain of command. Uh, yes. <laughs> I do not want AI launching nuclear weapons by itself. I don't even want human beings launching. I don't want anyone launching nuclear weapons. I guess that's where, my, where I am on this. I don't know. This one just seems like one of the most important and yet absurd pieces of legislation ever. There is a chain of command. And I think if we study the history of nuclear weapons, at one point early on in the uh, deployment of nuclear ar uh, the nuclear arsenal, uh, tactical commanders had the ability to order these strikes, although no one ever did. Then the president took it back. Uh, this goes back into, I guess, the 40s and 50s. And now, of course, the president is the one who authorizes it. This is so dangerous and so insane. The idea that our adversaries, whoever they might be, or our enemies, whoever they might be, uh, would also have very potent, very capable AI. Is the next war getting fought with nuclear weapons, or is the next war getting fought AI to AI uh, economically, for resources, for control of, of important resources or assets, uh, are going to go after the power grids or the, or the water supplies, or I don't know. It just seems like uh, we're in a new place right now. AI is a weapon. It can be weaponized. It probably is being weaponized. Certainly autonomous agents, which we talked about last week and we'll talk about today, are easily weaponized. I was having a conversation with uh, one of my friends earlier this week, and I said, look, once you give autonomous agents absolute unfettered HTTP access, access to the web and a credit card, what I really want is a bottle of extremely expensive bourbon and nice seats, good seats to the end of the world, because who knows what happens after that. At that point, Microsoft, I don't have a visual for this, sorry, uh, Microsoft is going to offer a privacy-focused chat GPT for businesses. I think OpenAI has said they're going to do this too. This may be coming as early as the end of the quarter. And what this means is they're going to spin up versions of chat GPT or GPT-4 for private industry. You will get your own instance of it the way you get your own instance of a server and you'll be able to put your own data in it and your data will be safe and not shared with anybody else. That's pretty cool. So now it's going to be interesting because is that going to be sold by the cloud storage and cloud compute team? Of course it is. And I guess what we're going to have is we're going to have Microsoft shops that will be in Azure and they'll have their OpenAI Microsoft version. Then you'll have OpenAI's version, which they are going to be just selling the artificial intelligence itself. Then AWS is going to have a competitive product. So if you've got your instances of your servers and your storage, at AWS, well, that's where that's going to go. So that's really interesting. Is Google going to play there? I guess, yeah, of course they will. So that's this is the inevitable that there are going to be a bunch of private uh, GPT models and um, each one offering some safety to the businesses. Samsung, as you know, earlier this week said no one could use ChatGPT at Samsung. If you want to use ChatGPT for your business, you can. Is it safe? It is safe. You need to go into the privacy policy at OpenAI, which is very easy to find. And you need to check the box that says that you will not allow your data to be used for quality assurance. It's a pretty simple thing to do. And then nobody is going to go look at your data. Is it going to be used to train um, their models? No, that's not how generative pre-trained transformers work. It's not how GPT-4 works that is trained on large corpuses, corpies, corpies, large amounts of data. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, it's not, they're not using your data to train. They would use your data for quality assurance. Remember when everyone got up in arms when Amazon started um, checking or recording 
or listening uh, to uh, the Alexa Voice Services um, inputs. And there was this whole thing, you know, is Alexa listening to me? And everybody got freaked out. It was the quality assurance people and the quality control people at Amazon trying to make the product better. But everybody thought this was really bad. And it probably was really bad. Same thing here. You just want to go check that box. If you really, really, really want to protect your business, then what you do is you um, get an API, a commercial API, and you pay. You buy your tokens, and there, there's a commercial license that says they can't use your data, and they won't. And that's the way that, uh, you know, it's supposed to work and the way that it, it will work. Again, everybody, if you've got questions, please, please, please um, just just ask them. We've got a question here. And actually, this is from Joanne B. Should I worry that someone will deep fake my voice, and how can I protect myself? You got ahead of me, but that's, I guess, because I promoted it this week. Do I have a visual for that? I do. I do. I do. Yay. Um, AI voice cloning. There are so many great AI voice clones out there right now. Um, professional ones like Veritone that you can uh, use, and they're doing all kinds of deals with actors and actresses that you can license. But there, there are 11 labs can clone anything. So in, without a whole lot of muss or fuss, it's very easy to clone a voice. The number of people who have written to me in the last four weeks, especially voiceover actors and voiceover artists, who said it doesn't have soul, it can't do inflection. It's a... Let's talk about this for a second. First of all, synthetic voices have already found a, a place in the content zeitgeist. If you are a YouTube uh, audience member, if you like to watch YouTube or you like to watch TikTok or Instagram or Facebook videos, you have definitely heard somebody just use synthetic voices to voice their videos. It actually feels a little modern. It feels new or it feels dated to you, depending on your point of view, but it is a common practice and we've accepted it. We've accepted it the same way we've accepted many, many sounds over the last 20, 30 years. 30 years ago, 35 years ago, if somebody used a analog synthesizer to mimic a violin or a viola or a cello or a bass or a whole string section, the purists would say, that doesn't sound like strings, that's nothing. But it became a thing in the whole disco era in the 70s we saw the transition from string orchestras to synthetic string orchestras, and people just started to accept it completely. And then all kinds of synthetic and sampled sounds entered the zeitgeist musically and became whole underpinnings of entire genres, not the least of which was the drum machine, drum samplers, Roger Lynn's Lindrum back in the day, late 70s, early 80s. There was judged by how much it sounded like a drum a real drum back in the day, and then the Roland 808 comes out, which is all synthetic drums, and it is, builds an era uh, and a genre, I don't know how many genres of music, uh, from hip-hop to rap, to like, you go down the list of different kinds of music that took advantage of, of these synthetic drum sounds. It's just the way of the world. Synthetic voices, already in the zeitgeist, already out there. Great synthetic voices that sound human, that are, are still in the uncanny valley where you kind of know something's wrong, but you still take it. We got that. You're about to be at a place where you can't tell. And Eleven Labs is doing a really good job there. So here's one admonition, and I think this is really important. In fact, I, I, I have a quote here. Hold on. So there was a, an Arizona family got an AI-generated ransom call mimicking their daughter's voice. This is according to CNN. A lady named Jennifer DiStefano said, and I'm quoting here, it was obviously the sound of her voice, the inflection and everything. So the family believed they were getting a call uh, from a kidnapped child. They couldn't tell that it wasn't the kidnapped child's voice. My suggestion, which, take it for what it's worth, I don't see this as too much to ask. Get a code word or phrase that you can ask 
a disembodied voice that would authenticate it to your satisfaction. It could be, what's the secret password? <laughs> and you could say, you know, my name is Inigo Montoya. <laughs> you killed my father, prepare to die. And everyone knows it's you. I mean, you could be anything you want. It could be nonsense. But I think we're at a time now where if you are even thinking you might get a call, uh, from someone who's cloning a voice of one of your family members and asking for ransom. I know that some businesses are doing this. We, we've had email fraud like this before where, where people have hacked into clear text emails in businesses and authorized really large payouts. We've seen all kinds of nasty stuff. This is just the next level of that. <sighs> Forewarned is forearmed. Don't, uh, don't wait till it happens to you. Do you need to do it today? I don't know. You tell me in chat. Do I need to do it today? Do I need a code word today? I don't know if I do or not. All right. One of the things about large language models that's really, really important is that they are amazing at pattern matching. And most importantly, they're amazing at predicting what's coming next. Now, they do this in ways that um, are very well understood from a, a pure science perspective. I think everybody knows now that these are these are language calculators. And um, what I don't think everybody understands is that anything a human can interpret probably is some kind of language with some kind of patterns. And so what's happened is uh, researchers at the University of Texas in Austin, they just published a study in Nature Neuroscience describing a, um, an AI that translates private thoughts from an fMRI, which is a functional uh, MRI scanner. You, it's a real-time scan, you're awake, and it measures the brain activity that is, uh, rather than slicing it up into stills, it does it in, in sort of a motion picture kind of way. It's the wrong way to describe it. It's real time as opposed to static sliced images. And in the old days, you used to put implants in people's heads, you know, the either implants or helmets or crazy, you know, stuff and try to read people's minds. But here, they're just taking a functional MRI and they had three different participants in this study and they listened to podcasts, which was amazing. And the large language models were able to decode these patterns and determine what was being thought. Someone was looking at a giraffe and the MRI fired whatever neurons, uh, noticed whatever neurons were firing. A picture was able to be formed. And uh, there's one instance in this study where the subject witnesses uh, an animation getting knocked over and the AI is able to reconstruct this idea of, that the person's thinking that they got knocked over. It's stunning. By the way, it's everything. It's not just your thoughts in an fMRI machine. There are radio frequency waves all over everywhere. Wi-Fi is all over the room. You got a Wi-Fi radio in your pocket. You also have a GPS radio in your pocket. You also have a 4G and a 5G radio in your pocket. You have a lot of radios in your pocket. And there are a lot of radio waves all around you. We don't see the radio waves. We don't feel the radio waves. They're here. But a um, detector could detect those. And when that detector detects them, a large language model can make predictions about what it is it's looking at and what's in the room. And I've seen really, really solid pictures of, of outlines of people based on Wi-Fi and radio frequency waves, uh, electromagnetic radiation bouncing off the walls, off the people. People absorb radio frequencies uh, differently. It's just like, that's where we are, folks. It's that whole idea of like, can you reconstruct an image? Can I reconstruct a room without being in the room, without a camera in the room? And the answer is why? Yes, you can. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, we've got uh, some more questions here. Let's see if we can answer this guy. Um, Anna S. Let me see if I can put this up on the screen. What is your take on these deep fake music mashups that have been going viral? 
Anna S. Uh, okay, deep fake music mashups. Let's talk about that for a second. First of all, we have to uh, we have to define what it is we mean by music mashup. In the old days, uh, prior to people getting access to the music tools that are available now using generative AI, in the old days, a mashup would be taking samples of songs and editing them together or superimposing them on one another. There are wonderful programs like Ableton Live you can use to do that. It's um, a, a really high art. We hear it at TikTok all the time. You hear it on, on uh, YouTube all the time. All kinds of mashups. Wonderful uh, dub mixes back in the day have now evolved into these extraordinary uh, ex musical experiences. If you go to a club, a great DJ is going to do really interesting stuff, overlaying and mashing up and mixing uh, songs together that make sense and take you on an emotional journey. Those mashups are, under the copyright law, considered derivative works. And they are um, subject to copyright law. They're, the burden is on all the people who are involved to sort of report it. It is way harder, way harder than I'd like it to be. Um, but but it th that's the state of the art in 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 the old days. And I say that with with tongue firmly in cheek because I do mean in, in the old days. It's not um, it's still happening. Then we had a new kind of mashup. A few weeks ago, Drake and The Weeknd, uh, a song was, an AI-generated song, cloned their vocals. And that was really interesting because that cloned vocal was um, neither Drake nor The Weeknd, nor was it necessarily uh, sanctioned. And so, now what? Like, who do you go see? We're going to have all kinds of insanity with artists singing other artists' songs. There's a not AI made, there's a deep fake version of Arnold Schwarzenegger's face on Julie Andrews as she sings The Sound of Music, and he sings it in his Arnold Schwarzenegger voice. That wasn't text to image and text to audio generated, it was done by someone who was using AI to, to make an actual deep fake, um, an actual deep fake, who was working hard to make it happen as opposed to asking for it to happen. You're going to be able to just text to audio, say what you want. I want Taylor Swift to sing this John Mayer song uh, in the style of Willie Nelson, and you're going to get something back. What is that mashup? What copyright law is that? Now, I had a really interesting conversation with the Copyright Office last Friday. Fantastic. Spent a, an hour on the phone uh, learning a little bit about, first of all, they are open for business there. They'll have a couple listening sessions and you'll be able to send in, and I hope you will, send in your writings and your thoughts to the Copyright Office. They have uh, different groups, some looking at fine art, some looking at music, some looking at video. And uh, just so that you, everybody knows, we're going to, in just a minute, start looking at text-to-video with Runway and Gen 2. I'm going to show you some really, really interesting videos in just a second. So, um, the Copyright Office is being very thoughtful about this. I think I've said this a hundred times. Most of you know that I started my career as a composer-producer writing music for television, advertising, and uh, TV show themes, and, and, and jingles, and underscores. And... Every client would come to me and tell me what they want in the context of something they already knew. Hey, do that Randy Newman natural thing. Just don't get me sued. I want to do like a John Williams Star Wars thing. Don't get me sued. It was always like thing and don't get me sued. And very rarely did they put it in writing because putting it in writing would get them sued. The Copyright Office is very clear about what that process is. Very clear. The client is sitting there telling you what they want. I want you to do this. Make it greener. Make it bluer. May, you know, it's like you're sitting there trying to say, how do I make that sound more orange, which is a real quote from a real person. Um, I'll tell war stories about sitting in rooms with what I would consider completely tone deaf clients some other time. But meanwhile, people just tell you what they want. 
under the current copyright law, whatever they tell you doesn't matter because you, the composer, will own the copyright when you're done. You are the one, you're the human who is contributing to whatever this new work is going to be. They may be giving you ideas, but what they're not doing is physically creating the work. They're just torturing you. And under copyright law, they don't get anything. They get to pay you. If it's a work for hire, they can buy the copyright from you. They can own the publishing. There's a bunch of things they can own. What they can't own is your writer share unless you give it to them because you are the writer, composer, author of this copyrighted work, and they are the person who is inspiring you. So when you go to, according to the Copyright Office, according to the Copyright Office last week when I spoke to them, when you prompt an AI, when you, when you say to the AI, I want Taylor Swift to sing a John Mayer song at, in the style of Will, Willie Nelson, you are not contributing in any way to the creation of the work. You're inspiring it to be done exactly the way a client would. Now, if the AI is creating it with no other human intervention whatsoever, it's not copyrightable because they don't know who to give the copyright to. This is now. This is their policy today. They know they need new policy. So when you think about a music mashup, when you take sampled works from other people's songs, it's really obvious that it's mashed up or, and, and it's really obvious that the work is now derivative. It may not even be derivative in, in the classic sense, meaning um, I, I, ins I was inspired by uh, a three-measure quote from so-and-so's song, and I'm going to use it in my song, and I'm going to pay them in some way uh, or split my copyright with them in some way. It, it, in this case, the, the mashup is literally samples. So it's, it is the copyrighted work. It would go under, you could take form PA, performing arts form at the copyright office, and, and that work is covered. When you put the two of them together, both copyrights are going to have to be respected financially. That's the way it works now. Nobody knows what happens with a clone of John Mayer's voice or a clone of Taylor Swift's voice or a clone of Britney Spears' voice singing somebody else's song as a cover I don't know how that works. There are state-level laws about username and likeness. There's some federal laws about it, too. All of this is, like, a little misty right now. A little misty. Uh, what do we got here? What is... Oops, launching nukes. Uh, I have no... Uh, I have no way to talk about, is AI really going to launch nukes? What is your over-under on the length of the uh, Writers Guild of America strike? Last time they went out for quite some time. They have an existential problem here. First of all, they're not getting royalties and residuals for um, streaming the way they should. And pretty much everything is streaming now, so that's unfair. Really unfair to the writers. And writers make the world that we live in possible. So writers need to be paid. Writing is hard. It's lonely. It is difficult beyond anybody's who doesn't write for a living's understanding of how hard it is to do. How many of you stared at a blank page? They don't get to stare at a blank page. They have to produce every day. Uh, as someone who composed professionally, it didn't matter what my morning was like. If I had an argument with my significant other, if uh, you know I had didn't have my morning coffee, got up on the wrong side of bed, client wanted product, and that's what I sold. And so, for better or for worse, you make a product every day. You know, write some music and write some lyrics every single day. It is hard, which is why not everybody does it. Writers get up, professional writers get up every single day. I'm not in the Writers Guild. I don't need to be. I get up every morning and I write three to 500 words for my blog. And every Saturday I write 1,300, 1,000, 1,300 words for my thought leadership piece once a week. I've been doing it since 1996. It's a discipline. I respect it deeply. I don't consider myself a professional writer the way that someone who gets paid to write every day uh, it is because I get to write when I want to write. I'm not told to write what I'm told to write. I'm not asked to write for other people. They are, which makes it even that much harder. They need royalties, especially for streaming since everything is streaming. The other thing they're asking about, which I think is unrealistic and, and, and uncool and, and probably not, not going to happen, and I don't know how it should happen, they want protection from AI. Get online. Just get online. I don't got you here. Get online. Nothing I can do to help you. So if they're striking about that, they're they're in trouble. All right. I want to show you some stuff right now. Um, 
you can ask more questions. We'll try to get to them, but we only have 15 minutes left. And I really, 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 really want to show you this. So we always talk about generative AI in, in terms of text. And that I've shown you mid journey before there is a thing called, um, gen two it's by runway research. Now runway, if you haven't used it as an online, um, online editing program, it's sort of like avid or final cut or Adobe premiere pro, but it's in a browser and it's got all kinds of AI tools and tricks and it's astoundingly good. So I just want to play you a couple seconds of each, each of these. These are done in what's known as Gen 2. Gen 2 looks, let me just see if I can find the Gen 2. Is this Gen 2 here? Let's, this is, this is Gen 2. Um, you just can Google it. It's part of Runway. Let me, let me show you, this thing is called, this thing is called Introducing Adamville. Just, just for fun. Let's have a look. Completely done. Attention to all you dreamers, innovators, and families searching for the perfect place to call home. We present to you, Adamsville, the town of the future where a new, dazzling lifestyle awaits. Just imagine, a town designed specifically for the modern family of the 1950s. A place where convenience and cutting-edge technology go hand-in-hand, -hand, ensuring a better life for everyone. In Adamsville, you'll find state-of-the-art schools for your little ones, along with parks and recreational facilities perfect... 100% totally done text to video, text to video. So that's um, nuts is the short answer. Uh, Sheila Buckley, you want to know how to get a POAP? app? You get a POAP app by going to shellypalmer.com slash POAP. app. Shellypalmer.com slash POAP. app. That's how to do it. Joey will throw it in text. All good. All right. I want to show you, this is, this is another one. This is called thank you for not answering. Also just text to video. Let's have a quick look. Hey, hello. Where do I start? Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry for being stupid enough to call, but thank you. Thank you for not answering. I don't think I could have survived the embarrassment. Just wanted to call and tell you, I don't know. Well, today's not the day. But one day, the entirety of our lives will be at our backs. And the what if of it all will still haunt me. What if we didn't get on that train? What if we took different routes? And if we took our time at different times, then maybe things could have been different. I was just looking, I, uh, I accidentally stumbled on a photo of us at night we first met at Dave's party. We were so young, but that image of me, that's a man who doesn't exist anymore. And you, you're just a cyber. So interestingly, that's, uh, George and I are Gershwin's summertime in the background, and I'm that I'm not sure how they decided to put in there. It made that's the thing that didn't make sense to me. Here is another. Um, here's another one. This uh, is called video of nature uh, generated by AI. Well, let's have a quick look at this again. Just a text description. I'm so glad you're here. Take it deep breath. This is for you. So that's kind of normal and and we've seen nature before and there's a lot of different engines that can do that. This is a video game concept that caught my attention this week. This is also text to video on uh, Gen 2. I really like the anime characters. I just I just like everything about this. Think about what it would take to animate this on your own. It's a it's pretty stunning. I mean, a lot. And so this just kind of tells you where we're going in a way that I think words can't probably describe very well. So I'm super impressed by this. Now, 
the last thing I'm going to show you before we um, move on is a thing called the anomaly of Kepler 61b and this probably is the most impressive thing I have seen from pure text to video and I'd love your impressions of it. The anomaly of Kepler 61b. Just promise me you'll be careful out there. The crew have bid farewell to their families and loved ones, but they're in good spirits and no delays are expected. We've detected an unknown ship drifting near our trajectory, and after careful consideration, we've decided to investigate the vessel to ensure the safety of its passengers and gather information about its origin. Upon boarding the ship, we discovered a single passenger, a young woman who appeared disoriented. As we approach our destination, an undercurrent of suspicion has begun to permeate the crew. Not everything may be as it seems. Now, all of these videos, especially the ones that are trying to be realistic, are on the just to the wrong side of the uncanny valley. We know they're not human. We know it's not quite right. This is text to video, folks. You write what you want and it shows up. Pretty fun. Uh, more than pretty fun. Real fun. Uh, if you are looking for apps, there are, there are two sites I found that will give you a bit of a playground. Um, one is this thing I th uh, called um, Futurepedia. It's futurepedia.io. And at futurepedia.io, they, they have this, they just list every site in the world. They have these little like check marks when, um, when their editors have looked at stuff. I don't know that their editors are doing this justice. I'm sure they're trying as hard as they can, but there's just so much of it. There's another site too that um, I like. It it's called Let'sView.com/slash/AI-tools. This is a little bit simpler, and it's broken down in a way. It's got far less information on it. Uh, you know, it's got some image stuff and some audio stuff and some video stuff. These are sort of best of breed. They're a little more curated. So if you're looking to just go experiment, this letsview.com slash AI tools is a pretty good place to go. Um, we've got a question here. Another question about prompting. What is this now? Have you picked up any new prompt crafting tricks this week? Uh, Billy M. Well, you know what? I, I, we work on prompt crafting. We've got a prompt crafting workshop. We, we do prompt crafting. Um, for our clients and you know all of the time so uh, there's a couple things you should do first of all I want you to go to shellypalmer.com slash AI we're putting all of our resources there so at shellypalmer.com slash AI you will find case studies and you'll find prompt crafting tricks and you'll find like all kinds of stuff that I think is really useful so uh, and it's all free uh, you know, you can go to MedAcademy there, courses.shellypalmer.com, but that, there's a link, there is a link available at the shellypalmer.com slash AI page. So definitely do that. I did find one other uh, site that I like a lot. Um, what's it called? Here it is. This is, this is really cool. This is a, a site called snackprompt.com. And it's like a how would I describe this? It's like a product hunt for prompts. People like just put in their prompts and they upvote and downvote the prompts. And I, I, if it's like for MidJourney or for ChatGPT, you might find it useful. I like just looking over it to see what people are into at any given moment. It's to me, it's it it's actually pretty cool. So yeah, I that's the. Th the fun, you know, fun, fun part of my day is just finding some other, you know, stuff from a uh, what prompt did I do this week that I really like. So this prompt is how I wrote my script. I, I since ChatGPT came out, I guess I'll sh I wanted to share it with you. You asked if 
I have a thing. You're acting as the producer and showrunner for a tech blo- for tech blogger Shelley Palmer's weekly podcast. As you know, he's blah blah blah. You're producing a news segment for the show. Please read the following text and create bullet points that Shelley can use as a reference. Be sure to include any quotes along with attributions, facts with cited sources, statistics with attribution that will help him accurately deliver the news on the show. Format the output with double spaces between the bullets. Here's the text, and then I paste in the text that I want analyzed and out comes the bullets and this is one of the fastest ways to write a script again it follows a very specific formula that we've talked about so many times you are telling ChatGPT what it is to act as you are telling it specifically what you want you're telling it you know wh- how you want your output and it just does the work now if you were to do that in something like agent GPT you would get a different result and you wouldn't have to tell it any of the things I just told it you would simply plug in uh, your goal which is turn this article or turn this writing or turn this text into bullets for a news news show and it would just do it so the difference between the autonomous agents and the chat client is that in a chat environment you need to chunk up all of the things you want the large language model to do for you into tasks whereas when you're dealing with an agent you simply tell the agent your goal and the goal is accomplished Uh, let's just uh, do a little more fun stuff here just so we can all be uh, uh, we can sort of, you know, wrap up the day. Please, 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 we'd love you guys to tweet if you can tweet because we like to promote the show. I'm looking for new titles for the show, so come on. Let's get some titles because Web3 Wednesday seems so Web3-ish and we're doing more stuff now. You get your POAP, ShellyPalmer.com slash POAP. That's uh, where, you know, collect five of them and you'll have some fun. We'll invite you to cool stuff. That's the fun part about having blockchain and POAPs. Again, you don't need a digital wallet. You can just use your email, shellypalmer.com slash POAP. Please feel free. Sign up for uh, Generative AI for executives. It's at courses.shellypalmer.com. We also have our Web3 and Metaverse course there. There's another course about crypto and NFTs. So there's good stuff. But if you're interested in the stuff we are covering today, we just added two wonderful new sections, one on security and one on on um, uh, autonomous agents. So you'll be able to learn more in depth about how to use autonomous agents and and what the value there it would be for for you. Um, The resource page is free, shellypalmer.com slash AI. We we do our best to keep that updated. The case studies there are pretty cool. There's a bunch of like specialized prompts for marketers. There's also a thing. Oh wow! Do I have time to show this to you? Let's see if I can get it real quick. Hold on. We're going to go to this page. Let me just see. This is kind of cool. I have a a couple seconds. Uh, Just scrolling down. This is the page. This this um where is it? Where is it? Was it? This is fun. This is our Mid Journey reference art page. Uh, If you're doing stuff in Mid Journey, you kind of need to know what what the art is that you're doing how would you describe Salvador Dali well it's surrealism is the style that Salvador Dali is known for here are three super famous Salvador Dali paintings so Vincent van Gogh post-impressionism is the style he's most known for what are the descriptive words expressive movement colorful um, symbolic enigmatic and here are some of van Gogh's most famous works so what we did you know subject matter expertise is so important when you're getting into um mid-journey prompting what I thought would be cool is if we took a major artists and I think we're gonna I think we're getting close to 50 major artists I don't know if they're all posted yet here's what Matisse does right Fauvism and, and it's fluid and playful and simplistic so this way when you do a mashup or when you're trying to do a mashup or when you're trying to you have some reference I don't think everybody's an art history major we're gonna do one of these for music too just so people have like some interesting references to uh, to use anyway um, that's pretty much the time we have for today as you know this is my absolutely very most favorite time of the week. I love spending this time with you. Uh, suggestions, please, 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 for next Wednesday. Uh, what we're going to title this thing, because we do need to title this thing. It needs a title. It went through Wednesday. not doing it. Um, I also would love you to send any questions you have uh, at any kind to me, Shelly at ShellyPalmer.com. It's my personal pleasure to try to answer all, all of your questions. We're doing everything we can to stay on top of this. 
It's coming fast and furious, guys. It's just coming. Oh, and we're not rebranding Shelly Palmer. No, no, it, it's still me. I'm just trying to figure out what to name the show. Web3 Wednesday just doesn't feel right, considering we're covering so much AI nowadays. Anyway, everybody, look, this has been awesome. You know where to find me. Uh, please stay in touch, and we will see everybody right here next week. Take care.